for what, what it's worth. Anyway, usually we have um, at least 20 people on the call, but uh, looks like we're, we're just us three. Um, so Rebecca. Summertime. Uh, tell me, you know, you still wanna go ahead with the call? Um, up to you, I mean, um what would what usually you would do in such situations I, i'm okay with uh saving the presentation as pdf for you to upload it to the group's web page uh-huh uh but we are we are recording so we can you know if you uh, make a presentation it will be saved and it will be made available to everybody so just let me know and I, i'm ready to go i, I very okay, much okay let's 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 stuff. do it okay so all right okay so i'll share my screen okay so uh thank you so much for taking the time to join this session today i'll put it on presentation mode uh, today we're going to talk about safeguarding digital assets with an enterprise-grade security platform. This headline is not, I would say, it, it is deliberately phrased this way because there are many uh, platforms out there, many, I would say, tools to be able to safeguard digital assets. Uh, but today we're focusing on the enterprise-grade ones, which are quite different than the consumer ones or even the, I would say, small business ones enterprise grade type of systems are required to meet several very fierce type of criteria and this is our focus today. Uh, it is my great pleasure to be uh, presenting this presentation on behalf of Unbound. These are Unbound uh, co-founders. Both are uh, university professors. Uh, the first one is Professor Yuda Lindel, who is the chief scientist officer and CEO of the company in addition to him being uh, one of the co-founders and Professor Nigel Smart is the second co-founder. Both are mathematicians, uh, year-long mathematicians in the academia, who were able to make a breakthrough about five or six years ago with MPC, taking it from the, uh, uh, not seconds, sorry, but even uh, minutes time to milliseconds time. And once something becomes as fast as possible or as fast as it could be, it actually opens up the door to uh, make, in a, make it an applicable type of uh, mathematics in this case. So this is a very brief history of the company. It started out in uh, 2015 and now as we move along actually into 2020, uh, magnificent COVID-19 type of 2020, uh, we're serving, we're very much uh, having the pleasure of serving some of the best customers in the world. Uh, all are enterprise grade in their size, in their uh, requirement, in their harsh pen testing uh, processes that they're making the company and its platform go through. Uh, <clears throat> we're also very fortunate to have certified for FIPS uh, 140-2. We're a Gartner pool vendor and we're holding right now 11 patents that are granted and about five or six more in process. Uh, so uh, market capital market, what's the market state? Um, interestingly, I've been covering or dealing with this issue as a product manager for, I would say, 
um, five years now, no, uh, before even Unbound and with Unbound for about three years. I'm now director of product management for the blockchain product line. Um, uh, covering several use cases, whether these are uh, capital markets, IoT, or enterprise type of blockchains, such as supply chain, just as an example, or identity. Interestingly, the capital market has been moving along, I would say, from the wild, wild west kind of atmosphere where it was very much banned by the enterprises and the big banks. And uh, lately, I've even read that JP Morgan has appointed a VP for the, uh, specifically for the digital assets or blockchain assets. This is after two years uh, having JP Morgan say that it will not deal with any blockchain type of assets. Uh, so this is really interesting, the journey, I would say, that the market is uh, going through. This is a scale of... Uh, or the milestones that the market has seen through, I would say, just even the last year. You could see the names here, uh, very honorable and respected type of names that are getting into this market. I think what's more interesting is the fact that everyone has come to understand what I would say the enthusiastics have understood uh, for three or four years already now. Digital assets are simply just a new type of financial asset class. These are not different in any way from commodities, from equities, from cash even. Whatever you can do with cash, whether you're even laundering money, uh, buying drugs, you can do with Bitcoin. There's no difference. Uh, the dollar is still the same type of uh, money with which you can buy whatever you'd like, legal or not legal. And you can do with cryptocurrencies whatever you can do with equity. There is a major difference in the fact that there are not any governments in between, I would say, the various sides, the peer-to-peer -peer type of uh, agreements. But still, it's simply a new blockchain-based type of asset class. And therefore, all the things that you can do with asset classes, other asset classes, you can do with this one as well. You can deposit very much what people are doing with wallets today. Uh, you can invest it. You can do many types of derivatives upon it, whether these are options, forwards, future swaps. There are magnificent tools out there to do atomic swaps uh, with blockchain-based uh, assets. Uh, so many things that you can do and the market is very much, I would say, just starting to emerge as a sophisticated financial type of market. Um, these are the use cases that we've seen. These are many use cases also, including the enterprise-based ones. But if you may just focus on the left side on the, of the uh, presentation, the financial services, this is what we'll focus on today. And specifically, we'll focus on the trading and custody. Please note the fact that there is like an emphasis on the trade finance because this is what people usually think of uh, when they think of the cryptocurrencies market. They think of all those uh, small, might be risky exchanges, but this is a very small segment of where the market is or what the market is doing. You're getting the Fidelities and the uh, uh, Geminis and the bots doing also custody. You get various types of custody and trading type of methods whether these are full custody, co-managed type of custody, or non-custodial. So many uh, business models that are emerging, but interestingly, they're actually imitating what ha what's happening with fiat money, for that matter. So if you were to actually bet on where the industry would go, you could very much bet on where fiat money is today and simply draw back where the digital assets or blockchain-based assets will grow to be in two or three years from now. Now, this means that behind the scenes, what we're starting to see are these. You have the, whatever you're doing with, with fiat finance, you're also are starting to see with blockchain-based finance. You see the front office, the middle office, and the back office starting to emerge is very sophisticated type of operations. Uh, everything that you see here, uh, all those tasks that are required in order to close a trade or to manage assets under custody, you're also having to deal with when you're dealing with blockchain based assets. Now, I haven't put any keys out here, but everything that you're doing here requires naturally some kind of authentication and authorization. 
because whatever transaction you're doing, whether it's the actual trade or the clearing and settlement of it, or the even the monitoring of you know who can see what type of transactions have been made, how much money does a person has or doesn't have in their wallet or in their bank account for that matter. Everything requires some kind of a password, a secret in our cryptographic type of uh, language. And therefore you need a key that would protect it. Now, what's the challenge with that? Uh, with the regular fiat market, the key is important. Of course, you do not want to give your password for that matter to anyone, right? But with blockchain, it's even more sensitive because the key is the asset. If one would put their hands or their eyes on the key, they don't have to even steal the key. They simply need to use it. Therefore, just see it and use it even once. They can empty a wallet. This is very different from the fiat money. In the fiat money, you have organizations such as SWIFT, not necessarily the government for that matter, or even any type of formal authority, but you have a middleman that if something happens, you can go to that middleman or an escrow service or a trustee and ask for your money back, complain or in, in some sort of a formal complaint. Whenever blockchain is uh, concerned, you still don't have those centralized authorities because the market is itself uh, designed to be a direct peer-to-peer, -peer, but it's actually starting to create all those middlemen type of organizations, the Geminis, the Fidelities, the Bucks out there, all the banks, JPM, Citibank, uh, Goldman Sachs, all are starting to actually work as middlemen, as safeguarders, uh, guardians for, for the money that we all want to be very well safeguarded. So uh, it is still peer-to-peer, -peer, but there are actually new tools to be able to protect these keys. Now, the threats are various. Uh, as you can see in this very, I would say, flourishing type of garden, uh, many hacks have happened along the years. This is quite an old slide, but it is a beautiful slide, so therefore I keep on using it. Uh, so many hacks uh, and so many people that have lost their money. Some of them, you know, you're saying, cool, that they lost their money, these are criminals or whatever it is. But it's not different than, you know, uh, stealing money with US dollars uh, or whatever currency you're dealing with. Uh, with blockchain, as mentioned in the previous slide, the key is the asset and therefore it's more risky or more dangerous. But there are additional, I would say, threats and, and uh, challenges that one must deal with. Uh, all, by the way, are associated with guarding this key. So you have outside attacks on these keys and insider threats. Uh, many of those allegedly, I would say, CEOs that have presumably died but are actually living on a, uh, some kind of an island with all the money or something like that. Even just operational errors, just you know, the, the ability to type just one character that will change the address of uh, where you're depositing money to. Uh, the regulator requirements that are starting to get into the picture in a very sophisticated manner. The insurer requirements, if you want to keep your money insured. The market agility, how fast it's moving, how many assets exist today and did not exist even two years ago. Or uh, cryptographic curves, uh, let's say Schnorr that exists today, did not exist, I think, four or five years ago. Customers trust still an issue, and of course the liquidity, which must be uh, assured when you're dealing with the more, I would say, rare type of uh, coins. Not Bitcoin or Litecoin, but let's say if you're dealing with Cardano, just as an example, you want to be working with an exchange or a custodian that is able to uh, liquid liquidize. I don't know if that's the word enough Cardano for you to do business with it. Any questions so far? Moving on. So how Unbound MPC security platform is addressing those capital markets? So up until today point, I would say we've been very objective in the sense of this is the, where the market is and these are the threats that you may want to consider if you're building um, an enterprise type of oriented of a business or you're addressing enterprise or very institutional type of customers. Now, I am representing Unbound, as you can see on the of the logo in the presentation, 
And as, as of this point, I'm actually uh, not being as objective as uh, I would say an objective lecturer would be or presenter would be because we do believe that we have the uh, most sophisticated and enterprise grade type of platform. So this, for example, slide cannot be shown by any other MPC player. Most are actually having, if they're doing MPC, they're having a two-party MPC. We're having a multi-party MPC and therefore being able to shred the key into N uh, parts and share, shares or shards. Uh, as you can see in this example, this could be five shares or 10 or 15, doesn't matter as far as mathematics goes. These could be servers, mobile devices of various types, um, and none of them holds the full key. Each and every one of them holds just the key share. The key never exists in its full entity. It's always generated, already distributed, being used in a distributed manner, and therefore not ever, ever exposing the full key, which is the main vulnerability with blockchain assets. Um, other MPC players would be able to show this slide had they have shown it using two key shares, not more than that. Usually they would hold one key share with the customer side and one key share on the server side being uh, staff players. Uh, and let's say just as an example, multi-sig type of players would show full keys and not key shares. And of course, HSMs would show the full key in an HSM. Uh, unbound platform is such that he, it has uh, a key signature and policy management. Policy for that matter is the um, actual representation of who can sign. Let's say these are just as an example, six signers and you have to have uh, two groups, one or two of each group. So that's the policy for each case. You could have different policies. And serving the enterprise grade type of customers, we do acknowledge the fact that they have their own needs as far as KYC is concerned, AML, uh, managing various nodes, uh, getting reliable market data in, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore we have an integration service bus where uh, customers can plug and play, if I very much would simplify that, their own uh, applications or systems, just say, pricing or tax and we have partnerships with various of these actors to be able to serve our enterprise rate type of customers in a, uh, I would say, most added value type of way. Uh, now, I'm not the one to say, even though I believe so, that MPC is the future. Gartner also says it. So um, this is not me saying, this is Gartner saying. So let's cover some of the challenges. I would try to make it briefly, uh, but still just for you to be aware of the challenges that enterprise grade type of customers or institutional type of customers are asking about. So one of the things that they will ask about is policy controls. These are not you know, the organization that would hold one key within the customer hands, very much like the consumer type of business. They need very sophisticated uh, roles management and policy controls that would make sure that they are satisfying their institutional type of customers. So with MPC, uh, which empowers organizations to have cryptographically validated approval processes, this is very different from application security rules. This is not if then something happens. Remember, the key is very vulnerable. So if then could be very easily changed by a smart hacker, but if just each and every one of the approvers holds just this key share, any hacker would have to break into all the key shares at the same time simultaneously to be able to steal, I would say the signature, not even the key itself. So if this is the case, we can actually build very sophisticated type of policies. In this case, you can see three groups. You could see that there's an external group to the organization, let's say the customer. You have the service provider and you have a trustee. That just as an example could be Deloitte, KPMG, RSM. These are just three examples with whom we are, we are working with. And you have a policy where you have one out of two plus uh, three out of five plus a trustee one out of two, meaning a policy of five out of nine, I think, yes. So five out of nine have to uh, 
uh, be trusted to sign each and every transaction. So this enables organizations to make sure that they're adhering to segregation of authorities type of policy or guideline by the regulator, which cannot be done in a cryptographically validated way when you're doing if-then type of application security rules. Another way to assure that you're following the regulators uh, and the institutional type of requirements are the role-based access type of uh, features and capabilities, where when you're dealing with MPC, a role would consist one or more user, uh, and it defines the right and authority level for each action. Now, users, as mentioned, hold just a key share. None of them hold the full key. And an approval policy is per type of action, meaning you have, uh, let's say, three out of five to approve a transaction. You have two out of three to change a policy, and you can go on and on with the definition of who can do what. Uh, the main, I would say, objective of using or leveraging MPC is the fact that you always, always have a group of users do something. Nothing can be done with one uh, user. And therefore, we're actually calling them in the system, unbound system, we don't call them users, we call them participants, because none of them is a full user for that matter. They are always taking part, participating in an approval uh, mechanism or action. So this is a screenshot or several screenshots from the system where you have an example of two policies, you could have uh, uh, N policies, doesn't matter. Not sure what and this is, like a, sorry? Okay, moving on. So uh, you can actually see um, uh, one policy where it's uh, BTC, Bitcoin, automatic day trading, and the policy would be two out of four. And since these are uh, automatically day trading, meaning uh, in this example, we don't see the exact uh, uh, parameters, but I know that these are very small amounts. You only need two machines that are compliance oriented, meaning AML machine and a fraud management machine. But if you're doing a BTC manual trading, uh, again, we're missing the screenshot here specifically, but you, had I shown you the full flow of it, uh, you would have seen that there are higher amounts that are relevant for this type of transaction and therefore requiring, uh, as you can see, two out of two, meaning an AML machine and a fraud management machine, but also a human person to validate the transaction, uh, at least two out of four. So you see this is a policy of four out of six. Parameters wise, behind the scenes, you can define a policy per asset type, transaction amount, time of day, day of the week, but you can also create custom policy. Now, this is an example of a custom policy where we're leveraging Cypher Trace. This is one of our partners, an AML partner for that matter. So, there, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Cypher Trace, they're able to grade each and every target address. Uh, from where the money is, is originating from. So if they're giving an address a grade of eight plus or nine plus, you would know that you cannot target this money or um, address or deposit money into this address uh, simply because it would probably be that it is coming from a terrorist type of uh, organization or drugs organization. They have very, I would say, um, detailed type of um, AML targets that they're working with, very sophisticated type of company. But we're leveraging their software to be able to feed Unbound Security Platform with a very sophisticated, proactive compliance type of action. So in Unbound, you can define to use Cypher Trace as an example. So if let's say an address is graded A plus, you would automatically decline it using bots. And if it's between zero and three, you'd automatically approve such a transaction. But if the grade is between four and seven, you would require a human approval. So this is one, I would say, additional layer of a sophistication of how you would use uh, the MPC. Uh, interestingly, none of these bots, uh, the data collector bots of CypherTrace hold the full key to sign the fact that it's an eight plus type of address. Uh, you actually need a quorum, meaning a group of these bots 
to be able to approve such a, uh, and I would say feed into Unbound. Uh, none of them holds the full key for that matter. You need three of them to say the same thing. Another challenge is the fact that insurers require the incorporation of code vaults into the architecture. You don't need those, I must say, in order to safeguard money. It doesn't matter security-wise. This is more of the status quo of the market. But insurers still feel very much uh, uh, have peace of mind when you do have cold servers somewhere behind the scenes, and we're very much respectful of these requirements. So therefore, Unbound empowers customer to create an architecture where you have hot vaults, meaning connected to the internet for that matter, but also cold vaults. And these could live parallel uh, to each other using a trusted communication between them. I wouldn't go into much of the details right now. I would say though that if you have an architecture where you have a cold vault, uh, the admin group, remember we talked about a role of, let's say, uh, establishing a vault, changing policy in this vault. So if one of the group is cold, it has to be fully cold, but also the admin group has to be a fully cold one. So there's no way in which hot members can change, let's say, the cold members to be hot ones. Now, if we take it one step further, you could have, and I wouldn't dive into this right now, unless of course uh, there are questions around it, but you could have a really sophisticated type of architecture where you have cold signers living side by side hot signers and actually be working together. So a transaction would require by definition cold signers in addition to hot signers meaning no transaction can move along, I would say, outside of their, any organization would, in order to withdraw money, would have to have the cold signers signed first and only then add the hot signers and only then be able to approve a transaction to go out. Uh, this is another layer of sophistication because Unbound is a very proud partner of IBM Z Linux One specifically. So the entire security platform of Unbound can live inside the IBM Z Linux One uh, platform and therefore actually offering our customers the ability to segregate the signer bots uh, within their own enclaves, have an uh, HSM level three and four be part of the architecture, uh, therefore serving, I would say, the most strict type of uh, organizational requirements if they happen to be part of the requirement. Another challenge is the uh, need to uh, supply or uh, attend to the needs of the regulators. Very happily, regulators are catching up with where the market is and issuing their own requirements. So just using a few examples, if you're using the uh, Germany Banking Act, uh, this is not specifically relevant for digital assets, but it does require the following. I wouldn't read all of them just now. The presentation would be uh, in your hands uh, after this uh, meeting. But as you can see, you must have, just as an example, AML and compliance officers as part of the approval policy. You cannot give up on those. Uh, you must have a reliable tamper-proof type of audit database or audit log. Uh, policies uh, must not include the custodian, so many, I would say, rules. And you have to have a platform that is very much targeted at these types of organization or institutional type of customer. Vault per customer, um, uh, strict, strict auditing requirements that will be leveraged by external auditors, etc. This is for uh, the very simple target of protecting all of our uh, us, money, all of our needs as, as uh, depositors or as save uh, uh, customers of these banks. And uh, Germany is one of the countries that is the first ones to actually allow banks, regular banks, to be able to safeguard digital assets type of money to their customer in uh, the United States has just followed. So uh, this is from the US custody rule. It's a very long type of rule naturally, but just a few of the items that are repetitive and are actually the ones that Unbound is proud to be serving their customer with. 
uh, but um, uh, it's pretty much, remember we started the presentation with uh, blockchain assets imitating the uh, fiat type of uh, assets, asset classes, and therefore it's pretty much the same, meaning you need a vault, which is in our language a key per customer because the key is the asset. You need a tamper-proof audit log, uh, you need customer-based periodic reports that will be leveraged by external auditors. You have to share them with the customers themselves. And of course, you want to have an insurable platform, just, just not just for the peace of mind of customers, but also to make sure that trust is maintained in the financial industry. Uh, the last example is from, is from the Japanese FSA. Uh, and as you can see, the rules are pretty much repetitive. Each and every country is looking to the other uh, countries to make sure that they're following the most, I would say, developed and uh, sophisticated type of regulations. So with the Japanese FSA, also you need AMA and compliance officers to be part of every approval policy. Offline signers must be part of the process. Uh, you must have multi-party approval policies. You must have a vault per customer, et cetera, et cetera. Now, everything could be maintained with application security rules, those if then. Let's say you have to have uh, uh, five people maintaining each and every transaction, etc. But remember, with blockchain assets, where the key is the asset, these if-then rules are very vulnerable, and therefore MPC is a better solution. Uh, another challenge that we've seen customers struggle with and are actually coming to Unbound and leaving, I would say, other suppliers is the fact that this market is so volatile, so agile, that new assets are emerging day after day. And as a supplier of these assets, even though Bitcoin and Ethereum and all its ERC-20 token, I would say children, I don't have to call that this way because they're all on the Ethereum ledger, they're holding about 75% of the market, but there are very new assets that are coming in or new trends, let's say the proof of stake type of assets. And to be able to secure any type of asset, to, to be able to adapt to the changing market needs very fast, you have to have a platform that is ledger agnostic or asset agnostic. You cannot afford to wait six months for something to happen because you might be simply losing the market trend for that matter. Just like in fiat money where a stock or an option would be very popular, you know, for a certain amount of time. And then after half a year, it's no longer relevant. We've seen that very relevant now in the last, I would say, six months. Some of the uh, options or stocks out there have become very popular and some have become yesterday's, I would say, news. Uh, even the most prestigious uh, type of stocks out there, let's say the airline stocks, uh, just imagine you having to wait six months to be able to sell some, such a stock if you wanted to do so. Uh, would be devastating for you as an investor. So the agility or the ability to adopt, to uh, protect and to be able to trade assets very quickly is, is a mandatory requirement and uh, being MPC based, meaning digging down into the ledger itself and being able to sign everything because at the end of the day, these are either ECDSA or EDDSA mostly type of curves behind the scenes uh, is a very, I would say, uh, important added value for uh, blockchain type of customers. Another challenge is the need to, uh, the need for speed. You have to finalize a trade very fast. You have to clear and settle a transaction very fast. This is not different than the fiat market. This is a slide uh, relevant for the fiat market type of uh, um, stock exchanges, uh, the NASDAQ, the Singapore, the London, Australia, Tokyo, all of them are, or are committed to be able to trade assets and clear and settle them very fast, as you can see. This is something that these um, organizations are being measured upon. Uh, for reasons such as liquidity, efficiency, and trust. And the blockchain market is not different in any way. Uh, it is very important to be able to not only safeguard, but to actually trade and settle uh, trades very fast. Now, this is a public case study of Unbound, the liquid customer. It's a Japanese 
exchange not now working under the Japanese regulation and starting to serve as a custodian by the way in the very last few months uh, it has published on behalf of their own uh, interest the fact that they're with Unbound were able to take more money into their hot vaults instead of just keeping money in cold vaults and therefore being able to clear and uh, withdrawals very fast in minutes time instead of hours or days time because whenever you're having to go physically into an HSM within a specific room you're actually having to gather people in a specific environment, physical environment, to, tie, to be able to sign something. So if you're getting a trade action on Thursday, just as an example, or Friday afternoon, you, someone would have to wait until Monday for their money. And when it's MPC, when you're using mobile devices to sign, you can do that wherever you are. You can do that with how many people and machines you want and therefore being able to clear withdrawals in minutes time instead of days. Now, the challenge is security-wise, in addition to all the challenges that we've talked about, is the fact that there is a status quo out there. Uh, the market is used to, from the regular financial industry, to be able to safeguard money with HSMs. At the most, they're usually working with multi-sig simply because it's been out there and more, I would say, understood for the last two or three years. Um, and you do hear of SGX being some sort of, not some sort of, but it's a type of a trusted execution environment. But also you're starting to hear in the last year or two more and more about MPC. We were pioneers in this area, very proud to be ones. There are followers. Uh, and the market is gaining understanding and is, uh, we're gaining adoption, not just Unbound, but the entire market is starting to, I would say, acknowledge the superiority of MPC uh, for other or above other solutions such as an HSM or multi-seek. But this is still, I would say, a challenge to convince the market not to go with the status quo. Another way to look at the uh, market as far as the competitive landscape or the ecosystem is the fact that usually, especially with enterprises, you do see them homegrowing, uh, homegrowing, sorry, uh, their own platforms with do-it-yourself type of approaches. This is mostly, I would say, apparent when you have uh, HSMs and multisigs because you're building the entire, I would say, infrastructure around these machines or these capabilities. Uh, the challenge is that with MPC, you must have the expertise of an MPC person, and there are no junior MPC out there, people. You must have experts. There are no exceptions to doing MPC in the right way. And therefore, regardless of me being part of Banbound, if you've decided to do MPC, please, please hire the best cryptographers out there. There are a few. Uh, not more than a dozen out there, but still there are quite a few. So please consult them, leverage their resources, their advice, if you have decided to go through this route. There are SaaS players out there supplying, uh, whether it's MPC or multi-sig type of capabilities, they're very respected, very good players out there. If you're a small vendor, if you're just starting out, if you cannot afford to buy a security platform, uh, if your volume or assets under custody are not that, I would say, significant, please go ahead and start with the SaaS platform. Uh, I, I hope, I, I wish you all the best in the sense of uh, being able to grow your business to cross the $100 million uh, assets under management type of uh, threshold. And from there, you'd probably be required by your customer to actually uh, control the key in its full, or have the full control, not the full manner of the key, but have full control over the key. Therefore, you would not want to be sharing your key with the vendor. And operations-wise, you'd probably not want to share the operation cost and the licensing cost with the SaaS vendor. And of course, the security platform uh, Unbound is uh, an example of such a platform. There are, of course, other platforms out there, multi-sig, uh, MPC, HSM-based. There are quite a few. We're working with a few. We're partnering with a few. So uh, there are those three routes. So if you're analyzing the market and deciding upon where would you go, 
uh, please consider these types of technologies behind the scenes, which one would be best for your needs. Uh, I'm, I'm available, by the way, offline to be able to take any questions as to the parameters that you may want to consider. Uh, and there are, of course, the, I would say, deployment methods of each type of uh, solution. Uh, I would say now, I would be repeating what Gartner is actually saying, that MPC is the next gen multi sig If everyone has started with an HSM or a single key type of signature and with uh, blockchain type of assets, have acknowledged that these are most vulnerable, as we've talked about, uh, they've moved on to having multiple keys, therefore having multi-signature type of uh, transactions. But these have their own tools. You don't, uh, or you cannot uh, support all types of assets very easily. These are very much Bitcoin oriented and Ethereum oriented in the two out of three. You cannot create very sophisticated approval policies as we've, as we've seen. You would usually add application security rules above the two out of three type of rules which are vulnerable uh, vulnerable as as we've shown usually if you're an enterprise grade type of customer you would like to start off with a, an mpc type of solution so mpc is the next gen multi c uh, these are just a few more slides as far as the sophistication of the platform itself uh not drilling into those this is the architecture behind the scenes i don't know Vipin, if, if we want to dive into those maybe we could take these offline if people are more interested um yeah uh, I, okay. I would give i would also yeah go ahead i mean you know finish your uh, uh your presentation okay. and then we can have people ask questions if they are interested Okay, so uh, just to say something about this slide, MPC is of course the um, claim for fame of Unbound, but actually with any security type of approach, it is very important to build a multi-layer type of solution. So you see here some of the layers that Unbound is very much proud of uh, um, incorporating into its platform. So you see the credential-based segregation, the software stack-based segregation, and of course, the device-based segregation. Uh, and you see additional segregation in gram, um, enhancements that are horizontal, not vertical. This is in addition, of course, to the MPC protocols. Uh, and this is an example of how a transaction would flow behind the scenes. Uh, very basically, you know, you may want to read through later on offline, but basically a signature is being created in an encrypted manner and the various participants hold just a key share and are responsible to decrypt part of this, this um, encrypted signature. Once enough decrypted key material reaches the server side, and I would emphasize here that the validation of the policy is done in a distributed manner by each and every one of the signers. So you must have all the enough, I would say, th th threshold key material to be able to decrypt the encrypted signature. And only after you reach the M of N enough key material, you're able to release the decrypted signature from uh, two of the servers behind the scenes. Again, none of the servers none of the devices holds a full key or a full signature for that matter and this is it <laughs> oh that was uh, fantastic thank you thank, thank you. you thank you so much for the time thank you for taking the time to join this presentation okay um we are open for questions i take it uh, anybody has questions please ask uh, if I hear no questions, then I will ask a few. Don't be shy. Money. Hi, uh, Rebecca. This is uh, Manny from uh, Swaps Hub. Uh, we do use uh, Unbound. We are actually integrating into our core platform. Uh, I'm working with uh, Roz. Yes. Right. Hi. Yeah, good. How are you doing? So Hi, yeah, thank you. It's great right, for you so, to join. Right, right, good. Uh, so if we have actually gone uh, integrated with your platform. Uh, we are actually able to do um, 
create our own asset and go to MPC and, and build the whole infrastructure. We, it's taking a while for us because it's just being in, incorporated into our core uh, trade management platform, um, exactly on the securities processing. Um, so one of the things that we are looking for is, I mean, uh, which, uh, you know, within and also uh, contributing and we're working together is to how to bring MPC to CBDC or the central bank digital currency infrastructure. So that's something that I wanted you to know, know about and probably we can talk about much later uh, when we have, you know, another time. Interesting. I yeah. love that. Yeah. yeah. Then, then the question really is for us is, is how do you, for just for you know, all of our uh, understanding, how do you compare against specifically Curve and Firebase? Those are Fire the, blocks, yeah. Fire blocks, um, so firstly, both are very respectable type of actors for that matter, but they're using different, uh, like the devil is in the details, I must emphasize. So Curve is doing two-party MPC, not multi-party MPC. So whenever you're working with Curve, you're actually having one key share on their side, one key share on your side. If, and if you're needing uh, sophisticated approval policies, you're actually adding uh, application security rules above that. I do think that they were actually targeting the long tail, the smaller actors. Uh, I wouldn't see, and their SaaS, of course, I wouldn't see any large bank working with Curve, not because they're not good, simply because banks need full control and need very sophisticated approval policies that are cryptographically validated and currently Curve is not able to do so. Uh, this is with Curve, even though they're really great guys, they're very smart, they're very, uh, you know, they're friends. We're working physically uh, about 30 minutes driving from each other and we do meet each other uh, uh, colleagues in, in conventions. Uh, so they're very good guys. We're simply targeting different market segments. Uh, with uh, Fireblocks, they're simply building a different product. They're building a great marketplace where you would be uh, using them as some kind of, uh, not middlemen technically, but they're building a marketplace where, just as an example, exchanges could exchange money between them too if they're closing a the deal with an end customer. Uh, and each of the customers, each, sorry, each of their exchanges, let's say Fireblocks customers are actually holding currently, by the way, still not MPC, but currently holding Shamir secret sharing key shares. And therefore, after being authenticated using the key shares on SGX's type of devices or processors in each exchange type of part, they're actually reconstructing the key into a full key therefore being able to sign it. So they're using a different technology. They're targeting a different market. They're actually building what would one call, uh, I forgot the name, um, like what Tora is doing, Tora Caspian, you know the actor? Uh, an OCC platform, sorry, an OCC platform, an over trade kind of platform. So they're targeting a different market for that matter. Again, the JPMs, the Citibanks, the Goldmans would not work with either of them. Yeah, uh, that's that's you know uh, that's what we evaluated, and that's why we have chosen uh, an unbound as as our, our platform integration. Thank um, you. I do believe just to just to complement these guys that the market is big enough for everyone. Like yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> Just only one more question. Uh, can you uh, outline about the MPC Alliance and what is Unbound doing about, that, about in, in that organization? Yes, uh, I think that Nigel Smart, Professor Nigel Smart is one of the co-founders of this alliance as well. This is pretty much like a thought leadership alliance in the sense that nobody knew what MPC was five years ago. This was kind of uh, Yuda Lindel, Professor Yuda Lindel is always laughing about that, that he's like a nerd's kind of uh, um, geek in the sense that wherever there's a big convention and he has written uh, quite a few books and, and many articles, you would usually see about 10 people coming to ask for his autograph. Now that you have this alliance and, and more people are aware of MPC, he's actually getting dozens of people to approach him. So that's pretty much like getting people to simply know what MPC is and how relevant it is to various, I would say, use cases and challenges out there. Uh, this alliance is a great tool. It's not a commercial type of alliance, uh, just a way to spread the MPC word around. Thank you so much for this question. 
Thank you. Any anyone else has questions? Um, in which case, I, I'm going to ask a couple. Uh, Thank you. What one, one is? Um, you mentioned um, you know most of the cases where there were uh, key loss would uh, lead to loss of asset. Uh, key is the asset. Yes. Um, now going going to uh, uh, mostly to public blockchains that seems to be true. Uh, are there any enterprise blockchains, let's say the ones that are uh, permissioned that you work with uh, where uh, that would not be the case even if you lose the key, uh, I mean, if, if uh, the key is stolen uh, because there are other ways of, uh, let's say, protecting the asset. That's one question, okay? That question between uh, the difference between public and uh, private blockchains for this uh, for this sort of, uh, I, you know, MPC type security. The second question is about various assets that are protected. You mentioned a lot of cryptocurrencies, uh, but are we going to see more and more uh, regular assets that are tokenized or even uh, currencies like CBDC, which are, uh, you know, which are not, which are backed by the state and by the central banks, uh, entering the picture and having uh, block, having MPC as a security method. So the two questions, right? One is public versus permission. Second is uh, these new type of assets because the volume is so much more than, you know, crypto assets. Yes, thank you so much for these questions. This is uh, a great way to expand this uh, discussion. So if, if I may start with the second one, one of our customers is Archex and they're dealing not with the regular Bitcoins and Ethereum, they're actually doing uh, tokenized uh, assets for that matter, just as an example, real estate type of tokens. Uh, their founders are coming from the regular fiat uh, investment type of industry, very respectable type of uh, uh, co-founders and, and uh, a customer of us. So yes, we are having such customers. I, I do think that they're working with public blockchain, not specifically private blockchains for that matter. Uh, but yes, MPC is protecting such type of assets. In that matter, MPC is agnostic. So we can protect uh, US dollars, we can protect data files, we can uh, protect database encryptions. The use cases are uh, endless in that matter. It is just that the, I would say the amount of pain dictates the market fit as far as the business goes because uh, you wouldn't really want to invest that much money in protecting, I don't know, uh, regular, let's say, emails, you know, I don't know, whatever it is. I'm just throwing here an example. But when it comes to financial type of assets, fiat or blockchain, you do need a better protection method. And MPC is, is gaining momentum day after day. Uh, with regards to the private versus public, yes, we do have private type of uh, private blockchain type of customers. I cannot disclose the names, I am sorry for that. But still the assets would be very much, I would say sensitive ones. Let's say healthcare records would be uh, documents, uh, ratings, uh, um, uh, credit ratings or financial type of documents. So this is a hint as to who these customers might be. Uh, so, <laughs> It, this, this is not so much protecting the key as far as stealing the assets, but uh, actually not forging. Uh, let's say you have a customer that has been editing a specific rating of a financial company or a company, and you do not want to or be able to forge the, the grade of that customer, just as an example. So it's not so much stealing money with these examples, but actually making sure that the data is valid, is, is, uh, is keeping its integrity level, or no one is being exposed to the medical records of people, you know, as simple as that. Great. Um, 
What is the full form of uh, CASP, C-A-S-P? Oh, crypt. Oh, we should change actually the name. Uh, it is just that people have gotten used to it, but it's crypto asset security platform. Uh, but I, I think the marketing people are actually eager to change it. This is like a uh, 2018 type of name. And the market has evolved so much since uh, two, almost three years ago. So I don't know how they're going to call it, but it's crypto asset security platform. Yes. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a misleading yeah, that's why I even suggested to your, your guys like they should change to digital assets security platform. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Thank you. I think they will change it. <laughs> digital assets security platform. DASP. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like everything is digital. I, I don't know when have you touched real physical paper money the last time. I haven't touched it for a long time. So everything is becoming digital. Yeah. Um, some of us, uh, I mean, the uh, amount of cash use in the US is pretty high, even today, uh, even after the pandemic. So uh, anyway, uh, thanks for a delightful presentation. Thank and you if, so and much. If, if anybody else has um, any more questions, now is the time to ask. Of course, it's only two minutes left. Um, and uh, as Mani mentioned, we are, you know, we have this um, in capital markets lab space. We have two projects um, that we are uh, working with. Uh, one is the um, one is the Etala project, which is a CBDC project. The other is for cross-chain uh, settlement instruction. All of these require signatures, cryptographic, uh, you know, authenticity. So obviously uh, we can lay the MPC on top of it. Um, the, uh, you know, we're, we, we'll continue this uh, conversation, uh, especially if we can demonstrate some of these, uh, you know, publicly. Um, Using MPC on top of this, um, this, um, these assets in the labs. Uh, the other uh, thing is uh, everybody is adopting ISO 20022. Uh, all the big banks, all the, uh, uh, they, they all seem to be adopting that, um, and it does not seem to have in the message uh, various uh, pathways for signatures. So they have a um, header uh, that is been put on every, you know, that you can optionally uh, include in the message that has uh, space for digital signatures and for other types of uh, cryptographic uh, surety. So hopefully your business will, in, uh, will uh, include those kind of use cases for, um, Bank of England and uh, even for the FedNow project because they are all adopting ISO 2022. Anyway, okay. it's been a it's been a nice uh, conversation. Thanks for uh, showing up and putting all this effort into the presentation. Thanks again, and you know, hopefully uh, we'll continue this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have Thank a great you. day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.